for the introduction, and uh, hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the title of, of this talk is, is long. Uh, so starting new conversations, um, field experiments on expanding the public impact of social science. Um, and this is actually like my first kind of foray into sort of doing something that is A, like really not political science at all, but B, um, is um, uh, very much about sort of public engagement with science. And so um, I leave it to you to sort of like listen and then at some point sort of ask questions being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you haven't read X, or why don't you know about Y, or how could you possibly think Z? And like that's totally fine. Um, and so um, I um, so I'm an associate professor of government at Cornell. The other thing, though, um, one full time job wasn't enough, um, and so I also um, started and uh, co founded and and run an organization called Research for Impact. And I'll just sort of um, tell you just like two slides about what that is um, because it does actually it's all about expanding the public impact of social science. In fact. Um, what we do is in part informed by research that I do, including some of the stuff I present today. So the stuff I'm going to present today not only is sort of hopefully destined someday for an academic journal, but also is directly feeding into how Research for Impact works. Um, and so um, Research for Impact does a few different things. Broadly speaking, we are trying to actually um, build bridges um, between research and practice. Um, and we do it in a couple of different ways. Um, the main thing we do is um, hands-on matchmaking, and so uh, using an evidence-based matchmaking methodology. Um, that evidence base is in part sort of comes from some of the stuff I'll mention today about how you build um, relationships between people who have diverse forms of expertise. Because that's basically what we're usually doing is bringing together uh, practitioners and researchers who um, are pretty diverse. Um, and so we also have a LinkedIn style website for self matchmaking, so people create profiles and contact each other, things like that. And then now, increasingly, this just started in 2019. This whole organization is, is relatively new. Um, but um, I, I started leading workshops on the science of relationship building, and so I do them in like, you know, uh, I mean, I've done them on four continents now with like a variety of different kinds of organizations government folks, practitioners, researchers, and things like that. Um, and some of what we've learned about how to bring researchers and practitioners together, um, so basically like what the matches look like, um, is on our website. Um, and I'm going to sort of point this out, and then with the slight caveat that actually this week we're, we're, we're uh, making a bunch of website investments. And so right now if you go to, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing, but if you go to this page, um, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Like you'll see like the like titles of like the different like briefs or like a bunch of one page briefs. Um, and then you'll click on them with like, you know, like, you know, boundless optimism and enthusiasm. And then you'll get an error message. <laughs> and so it's still a little unfortunate. But, um, but hopefully like, you know, that um, by the end of the week um, that all the revisions will be up. So anyway, um, one other thing about research for impact, and so in, ter in the kind of the realm of matchmaking, um, and so um, organizations come to us, um, and um, uh, they sort of like say, hey, we have opportunities. We're looking to sort of potentially partner with folks. Here's one that just recently came up, and I'm just like literally going to throw it out here in case it might be of interest to anybody in the room. Um, AFL-CIO collects lots of data. This should come as no surprise. They collect lots of data, especially during election seasons. Um, and they, have, they want to actually make some of it available to researchers who are interested in answering questions about like, you know, who votes in what way and why. And so it's, but they basically have this like, <coughs> enormous like, many million number of observations um, from a bunch of different election cycles over the past 10 years. Um, and they're making it available. Um, and so if that at all sounds of interest, um, it's all, again, it's all during elections, a bunch of like, you know, what are you going to vote for, uh, what do you think of the candidates, issue position kinds of questions. Anyway, if that's at all of interest to anybody in the room, you should come talk to me afterwards. All right, so now, the thing you actually came here for. Um, and so, um, so use, and use and impact of social science. Um, and so uh, let me just like, start with a couple of kind of you know uh, general observations. One is um, that you know I think broadly speaking there is a desire, increasing desire, uh, long-standing desire to um, close the gap between science and society. And the reason for doing that is varied, um, but you know largely speaking, you know be, the idea is that sort of you know there are many social problems out in the world, and the idea that scientific reasoning, scientific tools, scientific findings can help us to understand them, explain what produces those problems, um, come up with options for solving them, and then to evaluate the impact of those options. And so the claim sort of is that, a key claim is that sort of science can help. It's, not sort of, it's certainly not a cure-all. It's not the be-all and end-all, nor should it be necessarily. But you know, if you want to sort of think about you know, why don't many people vote, you want to think about climate change, you want to think about education, you want to think about that's just like disgusting, right? Uh, but anyway, that, what about that? 
um, you know, uh, you want to think about sort of you know poverty in developing countries, like whatever it is, you know, that sort of that scientific findings and scientific reasoning can be helpful. Um, and so, um, oops. Um, and so, um, when we think about sort of how to achieve that, like how to bridge that gap, one of the kinds of like uh, uh, arguments that comes up over and over and over again is that we need to build personal relationships. And so, simply sort of disseminating information, so not disseminating scientific findings, that's not enough. What you need is you need to sort of develop interactions between researchers and practitioners. And that's true for a variety of reasons, you know, largely because scientific findings on their own, they often don't sort of stand on their own. I mean, sort of, you know, how well they apply, what their limits are, um, and things like that, you know, how to interpret them, how to find them in the first place, all of that sort of comes from actual interactions, like actually talking to people uh, and having conversations between researchers and practitioners. And so we have lots of examples, um, kind of, you know, with that sort of general um, uh, recognition in mind, you know, lots of examples of sort of, you know, what those relationships might look like um, and that, that people have explored. So things like uh, research practice partnerships, this is in, uh, especially in the field of education, knowledge brokers, especially in the field of public health, uh, research collaborations, this is my beloved political science, um, university extension programs um, in, you know, certainly here at Wisconsin, certainly at Cornell as well. Um, then there's also, and all of those are kind of more longer term interactions, so also short term interactions. You can have online Q&A sessions, you can have consensus workshops, uh, science festivals, um, and, uh, and a host of others, including just informal conversations. Um, moreover, in addition to all of that, um, people have also sort of talked about like that there's a whole bunch of barriers. And so, you know, the number of people, um, including Kaplan and Bartunek, who have sort of written about, um, you know, what those barriers are. I do want to just sort of highlight for what it's worth that like, you know, I know that there's a diverse set of people in the room and like the number of like fields represented on this slide is like incredibly diverse. And even here, I mean, you know, Kathleen was sort of a, uh, he's a psychologist, I believe. Bartunek is in management. Um, and, then they, and then you have like a whole bunch of social sciences um, that are represented um, in the other citations. And so, you know, this, I, you know, people thinking about how to build relationships between researchers and practitioners really does sort of, you know, run the gamut in terms of um, issue areas, fields, and so on. And so, um, one of the things though, or two of the things that we, we don't really quite know yet, um, which arguably are important, um, one is, um, why is it that some relationships between researchers and practitioners begin, and others that could have begun don't? And so, like, for example, like people who have studied questions, like for example, the science festival folks, who so have studied questions about, you know, like why do people engage, why do um, non-specialists want to engage with science experts and scientists? You know, um, they they are largely studying people who are attending science festivals, so they don't know as much about, like, okay, but what about people who didn't attend? Um, and so, so this is sort of, you know, kind of answering that, or asking rather that, that counterfactual question. The other thing is, you know, despite the fact that there are many arguments that are made about the, um, and, and very like good arguments and convincing arguments about sort of like why dissemination isn't enough and why it is that sort of we need to encourage interaction, there's what people refer to as like dialogues, or like dissemination versus dialogue, like, you know, like what actually, like relative to disseminating scientific information, what impact do conversations have? Like what does it look like to actually directly compare those two? And so um, the field experiments I'm going to present today, I'll present the first one, or the field experiment that's meant to answer the first question in a bit of detail. This one I'll probably have to skip over um, some of the detail, but I'll just whet your appetite for more so that it gets to be one o'clock and you're like, I know I have a lunch date, but I just can't leave. Um, and so, um, uh, but, you know, um, but anyway, so the field experiments are designed to sort of, you know, answer, you know, these kinds of questions. Um, and so the, the theoretical perspective that I bring to thinking about these questions um, comes from uh, science communication as well as sort of the psychology of relationship building. You can see the link to the research for impact stuff I mentioned earlier. Um, and so regardless of the form, the goal, the time horizon of those relationships that I mentioned on two slides ago, um, all of them begin with a single conversation. And I mean, you know, take a moment to sort of reflect upon any relationship you've had, romantic or otherwise, whatever, and you, you sort of say, like, look, like, at some level it all began with a single conversation. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is what leads people to want to have those uh, interactions in the first place? Like, you know, what leads people to want to have those conversations? And then, once they've had them, what leads people to learn from them? Because we all know what it's like to have a conversation with somebody, it's just like, oh my god, get me out of here. 
here, right? Like, you know, you don't actually learn anything from it. Or maybe you're actually like, hey, this is really interesting. But, you know, because of like other kinds of sort of political considerations, organizational considerations, whatever it is, you don't necessarily sort of do much with the information. And so, um, but this is sort of, but this idea sort of that we're starting the single conversation, and I'm going to be sort of talking about the value of a single conversation, um, is, is, is critical. Okay. So, um, more on the theoretical perspective. Um, so, the, the kinds of sort of relationships that I'm talking about, and this is true again of all, the whole list I gave you a few slides ago, is voluntary, they're voluntary for the most part. They're not always voluntary. Sometimes they're a little bit more imposed. I mean, when the government says you gotta do something, sometimes they're not so voluntary. But, for the most part, they're voluntary. They're task-oriented. I always feel the need to say that, just sort of like clarify in case anybody thinks that I'm like about to do some sort of experiment on Tinder, like I'm not, I don't know. Um, and so, voluntary task-oriented relationships between people with diverse forms of expertise. And this diverse forms of expertise point is really important because like when the people study this stuff, so like people study like organizational diversity, team diversity, you know, topics like that, um, what they generally find is that um, there's like huge possibility here because there's huge possibility for sort of greater innovation and better decision making. And like a ton of different, and like this literature is fascinating if you are not familiar with it. Like honestly, like I even I tell my students this, I'm like, you know, like cancel your plans for Friday night, open up a nice glass of wine or Shirley Temple if you're under 21, and like just like read this stuff, it's fascinating. So there's a possibility for sort of greater innovation and better decisions, but there's also the possibility of that information actually is going to go unshared. Because a lot of times, I think we can all relate to this, we find ourselves in conversations with people and we don't feel comfortable sharing what we know. And that can, that can arise for a variety of different reasons. Um, it also is the case that there can be a, a greater interpersonal tension when you bring together people with diverse forms of expertise. And I should say, when you bring together people who might be diverse uh, along a whole host of dimensions, but I'm focused here especially on uh, the forms of expertise that people are bringing to the table. Um, and the reason, again, just to serve at the risk of sounding like total captain obvious, because of, you know, researchers and practitioners. Um, and so, um, in situations like that, um, the, um, one of the things that people are really sensitive to is the kind of stuff that, you know, all of you in, like, science communication, if you've taken science communication classes, I think is all of you, or most of you, or at least you've thought about it. Um, uh, um, you know, you talk a lot about sort of source credibility. You talk a lot about sort of, you know, um, like the perceived competence, perceived trustworthiness of the, the speaker. And that, and people in the settings I'm thinking about, like, are totally sensitive to that as well. There's this other dimension, and so I'm going to focus on the thing that I think is a little bit newer, um, which is, because again, I'm not just sort of thinking about sort of people paying attention to, like, you know, a pamphlet or, you know, um, a speaker um, or, you know, being persuaded by that speaker or, or things like that. I'm thinking about sort of the conditions under which people are actually having a conversation with one another and or, you know, learning from a conversation that they're having. Um, and it turns out that, like, the relational value of that conversation is something that people are really sensitive to. Now, I'm going to sort of point this out, and you, and you all are going to sort of, like, this is definitely going to be one of those, like, social science moments where it's like, I'm going to say something, I'm presenting it as if it's like, oh my god, let me tell you something new. And you're all going to sit there and be like, well, duh. And that's, like, sort of true, except to say that, like, when I then get to some of the experiments, I'm going to, like, you know, hopefully you'll look at them and be like, oh, I've never seen an experiment. I've never seen somebody showing like that. Or, and even, not even just showing it, but also just, like, you know, operationalizing it. Because after all, when you do an experiment, you can't just say, hey, relationships matter and wave your hands. You have to actually like design interventions to sort of communicate why it is that relationships might matter. So it's, you know, it's a little bit different. So, so when I say the relational value, so what I mean is not, let's say, the instrumental value of, again, what, do you, what is the value of the information you expect to learn, which is when people talk about source credibility, they're often sort of talking in those terms. Um, I'm talking about like literally what is the what is it like to interact with you um, with the, an individual, and so um, one one of the things that research finds is that um, people are really sensitive to whether or not the person that they're engaged with research and like common sense um, that they're really sensitive to sort of like what the um, uh, whether or not the person that they're interacting with is engaged during the interaction. And so we all sort of know what it's kind of like, you know, when you're sort of interacting with somebody and they're super kind of like disinterested, aloof, distracted, whatever it is. Well, so the alternative to that is sort of, you know, the, the name I give it, I give it is sort of to, to be engaged. And there's kind of a number of different ways in which you can be engaged. So one is sort of um, when you signal that you value um, what others have to say. And there's a number of different ways in which you can do that, and I'll briefly identify a few of them later on. Um, and then also if you're um, uh, responsive to their concerns. Um, 
And the responsive to their concerns is actually like I, is really important in a lot of the context that I'm thinking about because you know if you think about you know like situations where you're trying to sort of like you're having a conversation, you're trying to persuade somebody to do something that's outside their comfort zone. You know, like, so a lot of times, like, I do a lot of, like, trainings, for example, where I'm training, like, people to, like, be, like, citizen lobbyists to go contact their congressperson or whatnot. And, you know, I mean, like, even, like, super high SES, like, socioeconomic status folks, like, you know, if they've never contacted their congressperson before, like, they're a little, like, nervous about it and whatnot. I mean, you know, I remember, like, I mean, heck, I had never been to, like, uh, any of the office buildings on Capitol Hill until last summer, and I was, I went there and stuff like that. I don't know if you've ever been to any of the office buildings on Capitol Hill in, in uh, D.C., but, like, you know, um, I, I use, I'm saying in DC because I'm like, they might refer to like that as Capitol Hill, so I'm not quite sure. But anyway, not this Capitol but like the other one. Um, and so, um, uh, um, not that this Capitol Hill isn't nice, I've been to the farmer's market, it's lovely. But anyway, <laughs> um, and so, but like, I don't know if you ever, but you like, if you walk around the like Rayburn office building or whatever else the other ones are called, I should probably know that. But let's edit that out of the video. Um, and so, um, uh, but you like walk around, right? I mean, like, never, you will never see so many like doors that say on the one hand, like, please come in, we're so happy you're here, but also be slammed shut. Like, it's very like weird. It's, you know, it's, yeah, then you're like, you know, if I open this door, what's going to happen? And so, anyway. Um, but um, the um, but anyway, so the, this idea of being responsive to concerns is actually really important, um, particularly when you're sort of trying to get people to do things outside their comfort zone. Which, if researchers and practitioners are are having conversations about, let's say, you know, um, uh, what is the best way to mobilize your volunteers? I'm going to try. This is an example I'm going to talk about in a bit. I want to sort of persuade you that like you can boost volunteer engagement by, by doing these new kinds of things that maybe you haven't been doing. Well, those kinds of things might be outside their comfort zone. And so, you know, if they have concerns about like, you know, what it would look like to do those things, you want to be responsive to those. So anyway, so that's sort of, I mean, this is super vague and they're really, I mean, I could give you like, I mean, when I do workshops on this stuff, like I literally have like, you know, like buckets of sort of like techniques that fall into this. I'm going to leave it like that for now. All right, so let me now sort of talk about um, the two, um, the field experiments, okay? And so I'm gonna, I'll talk about the first one in a little bit more detail, and I'm gonna kind of breeze through the second one, um, just so that I, I have time for questions. By the way, I should also say, like, you should all feel, like, they can ask questions in the middle, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness, yay, you should ask, like, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, okay, so the first one, though, does anybody have any questions? Is everybody like, you know, what on earth is he talking about? I'm just gonna take this nice and go. Okay, um, so, Hmm. Okay, so the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this question of demand. And so like what leads people, um, what leads researchers and practitioners to want to interact with each other in the first place? And again, big picture, you know, those initial conversations, that's how you build the relationships that we know are important to expanding the, the use and impact of social science, right? So everything, even though what I'm about to describe is going to be nuts and bolts of an experiment, you know, that's the, don't lose the forest for the trees, even though the, the trees are very, very enlightening and beautiful, okay? Um, so, in a lot of my work, um, I do collaborations with organizations. This one is with a 501c3. Um, it builds awareness of climate solutions, um, and it's a chapter-based organization, which just means they have chapters that are they are based in Washington D.C., but they have chapters in uh, congressional districts all across the country. Okay. Um, and so um, this experiment took place. So the question was, um, you know, how can we sort? Or the question was, what leads? practitioners, which in this case is going to be leaders of these chapters, volunteer leaders of these chapters, what leads them to want to have a conversation with a researcher? Okay, so again, the claim is going to be there's research out there that's helpful for you in a challenge that you're facing, and the challenge in this case is going to be volunteer, boosting volunteer engagement, and we know that that was a challenge based on some uh, survey evidence that the leaders of the organization had. And so the question is, you know, we could either throw them like, you know, like Neil's research, be like, hey, go read this stuff by Stenhouse 2018, or we could have them like engage in a conversation, okay? Um, and so, uh, so, okay, so this involves group leaders. Um, and so they had the opportunity to speak with a researcher regarding volunteer engagement. Again, that was a common problem. This just happened. This was in January of 2019. And so um, what happened, so that 456 people were um, split, randomly assigned into one of four groups. Um, and so there was a baseline group. And then there were three other groups, um, two of which were basically putting into practice um, signaling that the researcher that they would be matched with okay, would be engaged. And so the idea, the setup here was basically that they get these emails and, and they're like, hey, are you facing problems, uh, are you facing challenges? Do you want to learn about cutting edge um, uh, or 
not are you facing challenges. We know that you're facing challenges with volunteer engagement. Um, you want to like hear about cutting edge research on how to boost you know, volunteer engagement, how to mobilize and organize volunteers. Um, we'll match you with a researcher if you respond. That was sort of the basic setup. And so that's why it's called matchmaking field experiment. Okay? Um, field experiment, just if you're not familiar with that term, just sort of, you know, so it's experiment, but in the field, and so it's taking place in a, um, a, a natural setting. Okay? Um, and the outcome in this case will be behavioral. Um, and so the outcome will be if they request a conversation. Um, and so, um, Anyway, uh, um, so the baseline, and then so are they engaged? Um, so this is sort of two ways of sort of signaling that the researcher that they would be matched with will be engaged, and I'll say more about those in a second. And then um, a fourth um, uh, or third treatment, um, which is basically just sort of trying to um, rule out alternative explanations. Okay. Uh, and so again, the outcome then is did they want to talk? And so the behavioral outcome for me for this study is just simply like measuring the take-up rates. So do the take-up rates of conversations differ, let's say, when you signal that the researcher is going to be engaged relative to not doing that? And again, I'll say more about these treatments in a second. Um, and then just, yeah, did they want to talk? Um, and then if they did, they actually got matched. And so and it turns out in this case, normally when we're doing matchmaking, um, when I'm doing matchmaking, say, through Research for Impact, I'm matching people with other researchers. In this case, just to kind of keep things a little bit simpler, I actually match them all with myself. So I just ended up doing uh, what ended up being 48 half hour long conversations. All right, uh, so I'm, this is the text. Um, that was, this is the baseline. Um, and so, but anyway, this is just like the email that basically just said, hello, group leader, want to strengthen your volunteer base. Um, we're going to connect you with Research for Impact. So this was like a collaboration with the climate organization I mentioned that you know is, has all the group leaders. But then also it's actually technically a collaboration with Research for Impact, the organization I run, which is you know sort of doing the matchmaking. Um, the reason why I collaborate with Research for Impact will become clear when I show you the treatments. But um, anyway, Research for Impact connects organizations with social scientists eager to share research and how to recruit new volunteers and further engage existing ones. Great. Um, and so then they just have to respond, and then we set up um, a time. Okay. Um, so that's just kind of a broad overview. Um, and it was signed, this was sent by the organization itself, and so which is a way to kind of increase the source credibility. So they're not just like, who is this random like you know organization doing what now? <laughs> um, okay. And so then like so this was that was this, and so then each of these just added a paragraph, and the paragraph got added right here in the middle. Um, and each of them referred to what previous um, uh, matchmaking experiences had been like. And so that's why, that's why I was using Research for Impact as an organization here, because it made more sense to then sort of say, okay, this is what um, uh, um, previous uh, practitioners who have been involved, uh, what their experiences have been like. And so, um, so signaling that you're responsive to others' concerns. So this is an example. So um, the concern, oh, actually, before I talk about this, um, the concerns, Whereas one of the things that came out, this was in um, surveys that the organization had done, the concerns were um, that group leaders were really, really, um, they felt like they didn't have enough time to read everything. And so like they were like, we're super busy, we don't have time to read all the stuff that you give us already, and so we feel under, like we feel stressed, basically. And so re the response to concerns in this case is basically sort of acknowledging that they're busy, and so therefore saying the researchers are going to be super efficient in, in the kind of information that they present. Is that that's why this is responsive to concerns. So previous participants reported that it was an extremely efficient experience. Researchers acknowledge that folks are busy and don't have time to keep up on all the latest research they might wish to. So the name of the game is efficiency. They provide a concentrated dose of news you can use. Okay. Um, then, so that's like you know signaling it that the researcher will be engaged, version one. This is signaling the researcher will be engaged, version two that then will value others' information. So previous participants reported that it was an extremely pleasant and affirming experience. They said that the researchers they spoke with were kind, respectful, generally interested in their work, and very clearly wanted to learn about their organizations. Okay. Um, so that's that. And then uh, this was a kind of, um, uh, kind of you know, just to sort of ensure that just giving them more information might not be driving results here. So I crafted another treatment that was simply just saying this is more details about the information being shared. And so previous participants reported that it was an extremely informative experience. Researchers shared a wide variety of new techniques for providing emotional support to volunteers, such as blah, blah, blah. They also shared many techniques for deepening volunteers' commitment to a cause, such as blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. So any questions about anything like that? 
So that's where, so again, they, people got 456 folks randomly signed to get one of those four messages, baseline, engage version number one, engage version number two, more information. So um, 48 people responded, it's 48 out of the 456. Um, and so as I said, I ended up having half hour conversations with them, uh, which, um, you know, so that was, that was a lot of conversation. Um, uh, uh, but it was good, it was enjoyable. And, so, and actually I'm probably gonna end up sort of like following, um, they all allowed me to like, um, to follow up, and so now I'm actually like following up with them. And so, uh, yeah, they, they thought they were getting rid of me, but I'm still there. Um, and so, um, and so in the baseline, not that many people in the baseline responded. Like you sort of, you, you sort of imagine this kind of like collective like WTF question mark, like sort of like what is this? And so anyway, but um, so there's seven people responded, about 6.2 percent. Um, and so, signaling the responsive to others' concerns had a pretty big impact in terms of it boosting the response rate. Um, so did signaling that you value others' information. Um, this is, uh, you know, this one was a slightly less strong than this one was, um, but um, anyway. Um, and um, but yet, just simply giving more information didn't really have uh, much of an effect at all. Um, and so um, anyway, so that, that was sort of you know. So what this sort of you know the takeaway from this experiment is that sort of people care about like what it's like to be engaged. And so again, if we you know sort of step back from the trees, so to speak. You know what this sort of shows is sort of you know one a it sort of suggests that you know people do care about what it's like to engage with researchers um, and so when we think about sort of building relationships between researchers and practitioners you know one thing that's potentially really valuable is sort of signaling like the ways in which those researchers um, will be engaged during the conversation. All right, so um, let me. Um, I was gonna. I'm gonna breeze through this barely. Um, so the second, so this is, that was the first thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm curious about the, the demographic of the people that received the email originally versus who like, responded in the PDF information on that. Yeah, so that's, um, uh, that's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't, I guess I have, I don't have it off the top of my head. The only information I have, I have the state that they're in, um, and I have their, uh, I have their gender, right? Um, and that's it. Um, the organization, of course, has lots of other information, but they're only willing to share so much. Sure. Um, but I don't have that off the top of my. I don't have the results off. The yeah, top I guess I'd be curious, like if you know, how can we break down in gender compared to the different um, paragraphs, you know, or something like that? So, like who's responsive to which? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's actually. Um, it's very. In fact, actually, if you. Um, if you want to, um, uh, uh, you can, if you email me in a couple of weeks, because I'm going to be doing the follow-ups, um, and for that, like the data set has all of this stuff, because I want to sort of there's an experiment that's built into the follow-up, and I'm blocking on for, actually on gender, um, and so um, uh, so I have that in the data set, but I don't have it in this one. Yeah, that's a good question though. There's also I also like have one of the things I learned in the conversations was whether or not. One of the things, I mean, I didn't talk much about the content of these conversations, but like a lot, one of the things we talked about is sort of the value of having one-on-one um, -on -one conversations. So if you want to like get volunteers to do things that they aren't doing, one of the things that's really beneficial is not to simply sort of like throw out to a group and be like, hey, we need people to like table on Saturday, but rather to like specifically try to like, you know, ask people like one-on-one -on -one and have one-on-one -on -one conversations about, you know, ways in which people want to be involved. Um, and so, um, uh, I also have data on, like, for example, whether or not people were already doing one-on-ones before the conversation. Like, was that like new to them or not, and things like that. And so, because uh, there might be also some really interesting like gender differences on that. Um, any other questions? About that? You sure? You sure? You sure? Yeah. Is there overlap that you know of between uh, like all those points? Like, if you. If you signal that you're responsive to other people's concerns, are you more likely to value others' info or things like that? Um, so you mean like out in the world? Yeah. Um, you know, so actually, so it's interesting <laughs> you mentioned that. So the um, so some of these techniques, um, and again, I haven't like well, well, yeah. So you saw that example, but it's like other kinds of techniques that I have you know explored in other kinds of research and whatnot, including this study. Um, so why I just put it up. Um, actually, come from me observing um, uh, like trainers and other kinds of like, um, well, mostly trainers actually, like kind of out like 
in the world training people to do stuff. So training to go lobby or training to go canvassing. That's a that one's a doozy, right? I mean, because like think about canvassing, right? You're asking people to like like knock on strangers' doors and talk about things that like they never talk about. And usually like what I've done it. I, the th you know, I've been working with like Planned Parenthood, so it's like training people to like knock on strangers' doors and talk about abortion. You know, um, and so um, again, so we're talking about things that you don't do every day. Um, and so, um, but um, but anyway, so but the the techniques um, have actually come from a, those observations in, in, in most cases, including those two um, that I just mentioned, those two forms of being engaged. And so um, that's at least some like circumstantial and not really super convincing evidence that like maybe they go together. But then again, those are also people who have sort of decided to be trainers as the, for their profession. Sure. Um, and so um, I will say that um, the there's like a bunch of like studies in the mostly come out of business school. They're like look at sort of how organizations work and they try to compare organizations that seem to be really effective versus ones that don't. Um, and so the people who sort of study that and, and that stuff. Is Far as I know, at least what I've seen is all observational. But they'll sort of like they'll characterize sort of you know the, the people who are more likely to say you know that they either that they act engaged or that the people they work usually it's more the people they work with are engaged in one way or then also engaged in the other way. So it does seem to be that they might go together. Um, one of the reasons why you know when I was designing this study, go back to this. Um, you know to even like say actually let me even go back to. You know, the, the premise of this, right, is that this information is actually, like, new to people. Because otherwise, if it's not new, then, you know, they, people could just be like, well, you know, I, like, they, they build it into the control group, basically, into the baseline. Um, but yet, you know, if you think about it, so, you know, two things, right? One is, is that, you know, there's widespread stereotypes within society at large, at least, of, you know, that researchers are extremely competent but not extremely friendly. And so, um, and then you have sort of this like, you know, long-standing anti-intellectual strain kind of, you know, that Richard Hofstadter wrote about and other people have written about more recently. And so like, you know, when you sort of put all that stuff together, you sort of say like, you know, actually there's pretty good reason to believe that like, you know, if all people are sort of presented with this sort of this idea of like, hey, want to talk to a researcher, yeah, they, they might actually be a little sort of, you know, um, uh, um, reluctant, at least initially. So. Anyway, that was sort of the, the premise of this was sort of that like, yeah, you know, that there might be actually something new here. Um, any other questions? Um, okay, so um, yeah, so let me um, so this is so that was so again that was sort of you know the idea was to try to you know help to uh, explain sort of you know why is it that sort of people um, you know in this case practitioners might want to interact with somebody who has a diverse form of expertise in this case researchers. I do want to sort of, um, the, the paper that kind of goes along with that study um, sort of tries to actually make a broader argument, which is that a matchmaking field experiment um, can actually be sort of a useful paradigm for like, you know, to, to be extended in a whole host of ways. Um, so like, you know, if you want to sort of understand, for example, when do policymakers want to interact with researchers? When do other, when do researchers want to interact with practitioners and policymakers? And things like that. And so, you know, you can sort of do other kinds of things, and I'm already sort of in the process of trying to extend it in those ways. Um, so here, um, here the setting is different. It's people who have um, are randomly assigned to either be, uh, be exposed to research findings, so dissemination, versus be exposed to research findings and also have a conversation about them. So this is again sort of designed to sort of test that that um, that comparison. And I want to sort of, you know, I mean, on the one hand, you might be thinking, like, come on, of course a conversation is going to matter and whatnot. And I mean, you know, okay, uh, yeah, spoiler alert, I find that, like, you know, when you give people a conversation, it does sort of, you know, increase the likelihood that they use the information more so than when you just disseminate it. However, I want to sort of, like, submit to you that, like, and I'm only going to, I'm going to, you know, breeze through some of this a little bit, but, like, but actually there's a couple of sort of interesting nuggets that come out of this. So let me just, like, like set the stage. Which is, um, so this was, so again, this is like a very different setting. Very, totally different experiment, very different NGO, including, oh, right, Rare, which is uh, based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, they do, um, this is, so they're sustainability, so they're kind of in the kind of environmental space, just like the previous one, previous organization. But um, they, um, they go around to like uh, developing countries around the world, and they train um, local NGO workers um, how to build um, social marketing campaigns. So again, some of the kinds of things that you probably take classes on here in Madison, they're basically training them on like how to do that. And it's a very sort of like concentrated like dose of it. So this program 
campaigning for conservation, C4C, is this like 10 day sort of like how to do a social marketing campaign kind of thing. The people who take this, these workshops um, are, work, come from very under-resourced NGOs. And so the idea of sort of doing a social marketing campaign is like this like, you know, talk about outside your comfort zone, right? It's like huge, new, and extremely risky. I mean, just in the sense that, you know, they don't have like, you know, a lot of like breathing space in terms of, you know, uh, for trying new things a lot of times. Um, so the setting here is, so local NGO workers are engaged in a 12-day, um, actually the program is 10 days, and I often sort of tack on a couple of technical days at the end. Um, so, um, engaged in a 12-day C4C training about how to conduct a social marketing campaign in a local community. And so again, this would be so like, for example, one of these, uh, well, so here's four of them. So Kenya, Mexico, March of 2018, Ecuador, Nepal in June of 2018. That's the data. They, they're doing these things all the time. Um, and so the data that, I'll, that I have is from these four. Okay. Um, I actually had the opportunity to attend one of these, um, which was pretty cool. So this was in Kenya in March of um, 2018. Um, that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, um, and, uh, and it was in Katale, Kenya, and so if you um, fly into Nairobi and then you basically just kind of go west, more or less, and you get, you get close to the Uganda border, and Katale is one of the, the breadbasket of the country. Um, and um, uh, um, and, um, uh, it's, it, and Katale is like right there. So this was actually just outside of Katale. Um, and so, um, the question in this case, though, is what impact does a short conversation about uh, relevant science have versus just disseminating that information? Um, hold on one second. And the relevant and the the, the, um, the science in this case, the relevant science is how to actually do a social marketing campaign. So again, it's the kinds of things that like you guys um, probably get in some of your classes. And so the um, and what this is going to be is sort of stuff that they didn't actually even, you know, it's a very short workshop, right? So this is stuff that's like useful and important, but they actually don't even have quite enough time to get to within the kind of 10 days and then and the two technical days. And so, um, so anyway, so it's, that's, that's going to be the, the setting here. Yeah? What's a social marketing campaign? Oh, um, so what they're doing usually is, um, they, so these NGO workers um, are trying to basically persuade, let's say, so like in Katale, trying to persuade farmers um, to switch from uh, conventional farming methods to biodiverse farming methods. And so the social marketing campaign would be like trying to sort of like communicate via billboards and radio and I mean, of course, if it was the US, you do internet too, but they don't really do internet there. Um, like what the benefits of that are. Okay. Um, and so as opposed to, so you might sort of say, well, like, okay, what else would you do? And so it would be as opposed to like, you know, economic incentives for doing it, so they're not doing that. They're also though not doing like, they're not going political routes, they're not changing policies. So basically trying to sort of like persuade, it's, it's trying to bring about behavior change voluntarily. Um, sorry, I should have uh, flagged that. Um, so um, anyway, so th so that's so that's the question here. Um, and so um, what we did is we took a whole bunch of different participants. Not everybody for a couple of different reasons, but like took 59 folks who had participated in four of these, and then we randomly assigned them to a control or treatment group. And what this was was basically after they took the training. Um, we randomly assigned them to either get more information about um, scientific information. That, by the way, what this was, like literally, was like basically like how do you do questionnaires? How do you like sample from a community to learn about your audience? It was like that kind of stuff. So again, stuff that like many of you probably have taken classes on, like here at Addison. So that's, that's what the, the technical information was here. Um, so the control group just got that information disseminated to them afterwards. Um, the treatment group got disseminated, and then also they had the opportunity to have a 30 minute Skype conversation. Um, and so um, then the outcome measure was whether or not they actually conducted a social marketing campaign. So the thing about this is that like, you know, even though, right, you know, people sort of come to these workshops, most people, and they come for like, you know, 10 days, 12 days, you know, and I mean, these are people who are, you know, traveling from, I mean, if you're traveling from Eastern Kenya to get to Katale, for example, you're talking about like, you know, 12 hours on the bus. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a long ways to go. Um, even though they do all that, most people still don't actually go off and do the social marketing campaign because, after all, it's incredibly costly and risky and they come from under-resourced NGOs. So the baseline here is actually like, you know, the base, your baseline expectation should be that they don't do it, despite the fact of having attended the workshop. Okay. Um, and so, um, 
And so, and the idea is sort of like, you know, I mean, from Rare's perspective, Rare does a whole bunch of different programs. This one's actually a very small program, what they do. And from their perspective, it's sort of like, hey, you know, we're in, you know, even a little bit helps. Let me um, skip ahead, um, and I'll just show you, like, some of the results on this, comparing the control group and the treatment group, and just also sort of talk about kind of what the, what these results show a bit. So I'm just going to skip ahead um, a little. I'm going to skip over all this stuff about what the conversation looked like and go to this. And so um, the so this control group is dissemination, mentoring, as I'm calling mentoring, dissemination plus dialogue, dissemination plus conversation, whatever you want to call it. Um, it had an enormous effect. On Again, this is the outcome measure here is, did they actually go off and do a social marketing campaign? Um, and so, um, and, and the, the cutoff was basically eight weeks. So we sort of, we had measures of basically whether or not they were sort of on track to be doing one, eight weeks after the workshop ended. <clears throat> um, and so um, the effect here was like enormous. Now I mean, part of it is because like the control group is so small. So again, this is 12%. So 12% of the people, you know, uh, in the control group actually did it. And so when we added a conversation, again, all this was is a 30 minute conversation. That's all it was. Um, it like it, it really sort of it skyrocketed. We had a survey that was sort of built into before basically the eight week cutoff. We had a survey, um, and what seemed to be the case from that survey evidence was that um, it wasn't so much that like and this is consistent with when people make arguments about dissemination and the limits of dissemination. You know, it wasn't actually so much that people sort of you know about like how much people understood the concepts. How do you do sampling? How do you decide what your questionnaire should look like in order to assess your audience so that you build a marketing campaign that actually is going to speak to your audience? It wasn't actually so much about that. It was much more about efficacy. That people sort of, that the conversation, because what the conversation was doing was giving them the opportunity to sort of talk about how the techniques of doing those things, like, you know, the sampling you would do in your local community, like, you know, like, how would it apply? How would I take, you know, what the sort of scientific, like, you know, studies say about what to do and apply that in my conference. Yeah. And was uh, Trisha in the receiving treatment or in the survey? No, this is what I get for sort of like having all the details up here. So the compliance rate is uh, um, whether or not people who were uh, randomly assigned to get the treatment, the conversation actually were able to reach them. And I can talk about random non compliance. The attrition was so they had the conversations or not. Then there was the survey, which was also sort of was like a bit of a. Um, it was a way of also being like a kind of a reminder check-in sort of email. And so the attrition is actually on that survey, whether or not people have um, responded to the survey or not. Yeah. So um, anyway, so let me, um, I'm happy to say a little bit more about this, but let me, I should, I should conclude. Um, and so let me just say, so, you know, uh, let me say a couple of things. So one is, remember, like, just to come back to the forest, um, increasing the use and impact of social science, um, you know, which is again, so the question here is like, you know, how do we do that? Lots of people are really interested in doing it. I'm guessing like many of you in this room are really interested in doing that. Certainly, you know, people who often sort of take master's programs or sort of who enter master's programs are thinking like, look, I'm gonna like take this stuff and I'm gonna go out and like, you know, work in policy circles, I'm gonna work in not with nonprofits and you know domestically, internationally. Um, you know, I'm gonna work with maybe service provision organizations. Um, and so the question is, you know, you're like, how do you sort of like you know increase the use and impact? Um, and so I think, you know, building relationships seems to be really important. Um, and so all of those relationships, though, which can take many different forms, um, they start with a single conversation. And so it's really important that we start to, uh, I, I would argue, I submit to you, that it's important that we start to understand more about like what, are, what gives rise to those conversations. When do people want to have them? And when don't they? Right? Um, relational factors matter. Um, I'm not gonna, and I won't claim that they're the only thing that matters. So instrumental factors, like you know, again, sort of you know, credibility of the person you're gonna potentially be speaking with, you know, that matters also. But again, I'm just sort of presenting, you know, this stuff to you, at least in the context of this talk. Um, and so um, it looks like it might snow tonight, so I might be here longer than expected. So anyway, we can talk all day tomorrow morning. Um, and so I, I'm like sitting at gate five, wondering what's going to happen. Um, and so, um, uh, so relational factors matter for demand impact these conversations. And then let me again just sort of make two, you know, more methodological points. One is is that you know this idea of sort of like doing field experiments that involve oh did I oh, I screwed that up sorry but matchmaking not mentoring There's too many M's um, that I should say matchmaking and of course and I put that that doesn't help at all right and so like anyway and I'm like way too short for that thing um, and so uh, anyway um, you should see like when I teach like. 
my like large undergraduate lecture classes, and I have to sort. I try to like just jump to the top of like you know, <laughs> and uh, it just doesn't really work well. Anyway, um, and so um, one time, actually, slight side note, unrelated to the methodological point, I had a student. I'm, I'm, this is gonna be videotaped too. Um, I had a student who was great, and she um, she, uh, uh, she was a great student, but she also was on crutches because she had broken her foot, and so uh, but she allowed me to like use her crutch, so I, so I, so I could, like pick up the crutch, and I could like point at stuff. <laughs> That was kind of helpful, but anyway. Um, and so uh, she was a great student. Um, and um, uh, not because of that, but also because she asked really good questions and did well on exam. Anyway. Um, and so, um, but so, uh, so, so right. So the, the uh, not mentoring, the, the uh, matchmaking, you know, that I think that, you know, that kind of, you know, I, I view that as potentially sort of a model or a paradigm for sort of how we can sort of answer a whole host of questions about not just when do practitioners want to interact with researchers, like what I presented to you, but also, again, you know, when do policymakers want to interact with researchers, when do researchers want to interact with both of them, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so that's the demand questions, and then what I'm calling the sort of impact field experiments a way for studying the impact of those conversations after they've occurred. You can also, you know, combine the two. And so, like, for example, here, you know, with the matchmaking, I only sort of talked about the inception. But you can then sort of, you know, imagine sort of, you know, saying, all right, I'm going to take into account selection effects, so whether or not people select into having a conversation, and then consider branching, mm -hmm. you know, which is then what happens down the line. Of course, I haven't done that here. These were, you know, again, sort of two, these were two completely separate experiments with different groups, but you can imagine doing that in the future as well. And so, um, anyway, um, I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, happy to take any other questions, or and happy to go back to stuff I skipped over. Happy to, I mean, I don't want to say this. I was happy to have you leave early, but I don't actually mean that. That would be kind of sad. So, but yeah, any questions?